Great. Hello. Um, this is um, Thea Blackmore from Disability Cornwall um, doing the first podcast, in fact, of 2023. And I'm very happy to be talking to Rick from the Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, Rick? Hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Rick Burgess from the GM Coalition to Sell People. Happy New Year, listeners. Um, and uh, we are a DPO in Greater Manchester. Seems a bit late to be talking about Happy New Year still. At what, <laughs> what point do we stop saying that? We're now in February 2023. I normally stop in about October, I think. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, if this is the first of the, the year, then I think we, you know, we can welcome it. Very good. So this is um, very interesting to talk to you um, as we are, I'm based down to the west of Penzance is where I live and I work from home um, and Disability Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly is located in a town called Hale, which is also in West Cornwall. So we are very far away from you. Um, it's a very rural area down here. The stuff that people are dealing with and we are dealing with as organisations are kind of very rural in nature so there's lots of stuff about transport it will be interesting to hear this from you actually we'll talk a bit more about these things in a minute i always imagine some of these things are going to be very local and very rural um in nature but i think that a lot of the issues that we deal with are probably similar to the issues that you deal with in in in, in manchester but we'll find that kind of thing out um so you work for your involved with the organization the greater manchester coalition of disabled people and i had a look at your website briefly and saw that you were formed in 1985 which is a heck of a long time ago so you're one of the older um disabled people's organizations in the uk i would imagine uh yeah i'm not actually sure how those rankings work but we're one of the oldest and i suppose realistically that's when we became a company limited by guarantee, which was the only legal structure at the time that, you know, we could have that wasn't a charity, which is important. Um, we are going to become a CIC, though, now that that exists. Uh, but the the people who formed that core of the coalition probably started talking about it in meeting, I would say, uh, from 1983, you know, a couple of years before that. You know, they were, they, they got together and they started talking and... Um, yeah, it became official in 1985. So we will be celebrating a big anniversary in a couple of years. That is amazing. You know, so, all, you know, the kind of one of the starting points that people talk about in the UK in relation to disabled people's organisations is the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation. And that was mm. in the sort of mid to late 70s. So 1983 is is a very early stage for your organisation to be going. Yeah, I totally. Um, from from their work, the UPIAS, I'm trying to get that right, yeah. is um, that absolutely was. Um, I mean, it was it was real and live and, and absolutely happening uh, at the time. And uh, I remember talking to one of our uh, original members, Martin Pagel, um, uh, who uh, you know talked about how they developed ideas and, you know, could have evolved the social model. Um, just a lot of kind of phone calls and meetings in pubs, things like that. You know, it was really was a genuine, you know, organic movement of the community. Um, and I think the, that abs the work in the 70s absolutely um, kind of laid the groundwork for people to then go, right, we actually need to have organisations where we live to take this further and to to work collectively, you know, on on defending ourselves and then advancing our rights. And it's, you know, a totally different world from the world we live in today. So this is the 21st century now that we're living in. And, you know, as I said before, I had a look on your website to see that you have set up in 1985. Well, there was no internet back then. There was <laughs> none of this, you know, how we all got in touch with each other was because we knew each other and we wrote letters and made phone calls and met in pubs, like you say. Yeah, and uh, um, a large part of it was, uh, as I'm told by the, <laughs> it's, it's the what what used to be called Stratford Arndale, um, which is now called Stratford Shopping Mall, but um, I don't know, just by accident or or good luck or maybe even design, it was actually quite accessible, and and so a group of people, disabled people who were also interested in in sports, uh, kind of that became a hub for them and that enabled them to meet and, you know, plot together as well. So all these things kind of, you know, came together and they had 
there were members who worked at Manchester Council, so they were able to give them like the the lowdown on what the council was thinking and where they might look for funding and that kind of thing. So um, I'd say that probably, you know, all DPOs across the country, they, they probably kind of came to it by their own organic process. There was no one story that's identical with anyone else's. Um, but that's sort of the fascinating part of it. And, and one of the, obviously, the projects we do, which um, is is the Disabled People's Archive, which is, as we speak, uncovering dusty documents detailing this history and, you know, history across the country. And so uh, across the country, so it is a national project, the history project. Yes, um, absolutely is. Um, it's partnership with Manchester Central Library, Archives Plus, um, and we got a... A significant uh, support from the, I think it was Wellcome Foundation to fund um, more work on it. So that's ongoing. And we've got three three members of staff work on the archive team. Um, Luke heads that, heads that up and hopefully you, you can talk to him uh, about that. And um, it's that as well. In fact, we, um, we recently, uh, well, actually for a few years, we've been working with the People's History Museum. And so they, they've now got their big exhibition, Nothing About Us Without Us. So that was co-produced with disabled people, with people involved in the archive, with the coalition, with other um, DPOs in Greater Manchester and and across the Northwest, I would say. Um, so it's actually quite a um, productive, exciting time for sort of history and archiving and uh, making sure that our... Um, our movements, you know, moments are not forgotten, but also, and I always think that um, Linda at the coalition who, who used to run the archive team, she used to get, uh, she used to say she got unreasonably excited by things like a photo, like a, 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 a parking ticket or a parking fine that what a van got. Um, and when it, they were doing a demo and they were unloading things and they got, and it was like, oh, that was real history. Brilliant. No, you're right. Uh, it's real history. You know, we did a project down here in Cornwall um, at Disability Cornwall, and that was like 2012 to 2014, but it was like an oral history project. A bit of that involved going through archives and finding out history, um, but a lot of it was based around people's lived experience. So, mm. you know, that's a video project that's up available on our website, but it would be interesting to put that into your archive if it's a bit of history that you'd be interested in as well. Oh, you know, to I mean, um, I don't want to make promises that I'm sort of no. saying to everyone, send everything to Manchester. But, um, you know, I, 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 in a way, I kind of feel like the more authoritative and kind of people investing in it, it becomes the importance of it. It means that they can't kind of um, ignore it or stop funding it. You know, it's really important yeah. history. Um, even to the point, you know, I kind of, I had like, a, you know, covered under the stairs filled with placards and banners. And it was sort of like... <laughs> And it's like, don't throw them away. Give them to me. It's like, okay, okay. I got, you know, you, what what you think is just kind of stuff cluttering up your house actually could be really important historical material. Yeah, no, it's great. It's and we all need we need to keep hold of these things because these are memories that we need to pass on to the next generation. You know, mm. I consider myself an old person now. I'm an old white male and in the movement. And hopefully there'll be younger people coming through who want to get involved. And I think hopefully they'll mm. find these things as exciting as I find them. And you obviously as well. Yeah, I, I think I, I think there's a real practical part to it, which is to yeah, that education and it to get young people kind of um you know knowing that it's not always been like how it is now and we had to fight for how it is now and we need to keep fighting because we're not we're not in like some but in fact you know to be frank we're we're, we're in a period of regression you know our rights have been under attack probably for, i would say for about 15 years now um so actually you know to to get that kind of that flow of a movement you know you have peaks and troughs and there's times you're making advances the time uh, you know advances there's times you're defending and i think at the moment you know we're, we're doing an awful lot of defending simply because of the, the the regression that's going on yeah no things so something that occurred to me which i've often heard and i'm not certain is true or not but you might be able to let me know is that the disability movement um there's there's a real kind of stronghold and a real strength of the disabled people's movement in the West Midlands, and I don't know why that would have been, but is there some kind of reason for that? I mean, because you've got quite a lot of DPOs in the West Midlands. I've recently mapped out disabled people's organisations and where they are across the country, and there are big gaps in the country where there are not any disabled people's organisations. 
And there are other pockets where there's quite a lot. We'd expect there to be quite a few in the southeast, down in the London area. Um, and also the West Midlands seems to be quite quite a lot of organisations there. I guess you've got some big conurbations with Manchester, mm. Liverpool, you know, all sorts of different big cities there. Well, I, um, it's... We're not, we're not the West Midlands, we're the North West. <laughs> you are the North West. Sorry about that. There you go. I would say that... There. Yeah, the, the Westminster, I think that is that that geographical um thing of that is where the uh UPIAS um were operating. And I think that, that absolutely has had um you know that that knock-on effect of there being quite a few. Although and, and I think what's the name of the it was a project, and I think you can get it on the Inclusion London website about the funding of DPOs, and that was a we were the Northwest partners on that, and that's got quite a good mapping of um you know dpos and and, you know also what 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 would be needed to you know provide sustainable core funding for us because that's one of the things that's missing across the sector um so it it's yeah it's um i don't i I think it might also be something to do with just the general history of that of, of areas that have had a lot of industry and union activity maybe yeah that kind of um, self mobilization yeah i i i I, I, that that would I, I would hazard a guess there, but um, other people with more expertise could answer you better, probably. So tell me about. Oh, well, before we go there, actually, you said something at the beginning of the conversation which is really interesting. You said that you're not a charity; you're a company limited by guarantee. What's what's your thinking there? Well, at the time of the formation. Um, very much, you know, there were, <laughs> shall I name some now? <laughs> there were some charities who were very much like part of the oppression of disabled people. Um, they still exist. They're big names. Um, they got a lot of money, millions and millions of pounds. And, but they, you know, they would run um, homes that people were basically trapped in. They would take service contracts um, so they wouldn't speak out on sort of political and rights matters. And that's still kind of the case. Um, plus, of course, the charity model is, you know, it is a specific way of approaching disability and society, which we, you know, we don't agree with because we work from the social model, um, which is very much, you know, about changing society so that, you know, it is not disabling us. We are removing those barriers. So I think when it came to the formation, they they looked at how, you know, what available legal structures did exist. and. Um, the the near the you know the one that allowed them to you know function have accounts that kind of thing pay staff um, was was to a non profit limited company and um, now there is a C, the CIC structure exists um, we we are looking to become a CIC but at the time CIC being, well much yeah. sorry CIC is a community interest company yes which isn't perfect in itself but it's it's more um, it's more kind of uh, suitable for what, you know, and there are DPOs that are constituted charities and that, you know, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they work from a charity model. It's just that that's the legal business structure that's, that best suits, you know, what they needed to do. And I think it was just that it was having that position on the social model and also needing to have a legal structure. Um, so, but I, I do think that's, you know, worth, I think, remember people remembering that, um, the the charity approach disability is is not the social model approach, and the social model is is looking at a much more profound um, movement towards changing society, towards embodying our rights. You know, rather than just you know philanthropy and and sort of you know that that sort of charity approach. And so, if you're not a charity, does that make does that mean that some of the sources of funding are not available to you that other organisations can go for as charities? Uh, the, yeah, as this is why we're moving to CIC, particularly came up with COVID uh, over the lockdowns, is some of the pots of like emergency funding, they they were only giving to CICs or charities. They didn't understand why a disabled people's organisation wasn't a charity or a CIC. And while we could explain it to them, it didn't fundamentally, it was there's so few of us in that kind of historic envelope that you know they weren't changing their procedures so it does make um access to certain funding different 
so yeah cic will mean that we are we are better suited in that way um yeah going back to the historical archive again and finding loads of banners underneath your stairs one of the big banners from the early days was rights not charity yes and that's very strongly where you're located obviously um mm. you know it is about it is about human rights at the end of the day and the social model is a very strong part of that is shifting the social model in my mind what it did was it shifted the idea of disability away from a medicalized understanding of the individual and his or her impairments to a society and its disabling barriers and it moved it mm -hmm. into a political identity rather than being an individual deficit model yeah and i think it's it, also from just from a community point of view it it's a model that um enables people to collectively come together to remove those barriers as opposed you know one of the things that you know and, and you know for good or ill but you know you tend to get charities that will some often divide along impairment and condition lines and you know there's just from a strategic point of view um that means you've got lots of small groups of people that isn't as effective as one big group of people the social model allows for one big group and, and when you're trying to change political structures trying to change attitudes trying to change you know cultural beliefs in a society the larger the group you've got the, the better chance you have of doing that it's a it's just simply the sort of the mathematics of of to, to some extent conflict you know i mean the language that you're using is very it's kind of almost you know digging the trenches so you've got the words of strate strategy and strategic and uh you know the, the, drawing the battle lines of where we need to be and what we need to be doing do, mate, you, mate. There's a, do you think do you find that there's do you think that there's there is a national way of or is there a national kind of because that kind of bringing together of organizations of people disabled people so that we can fight the fight on that kind of big scale to do the things that you're talking about changing is there a national voice that we need to kind of be linking up behind to do that kind of work uh, there is and in the past that sort of has been but there's been a period where there's been no you know uh funded umbrella kind of org like a sort of you know the TUC of DPOs or the United Nations you know that the um however what was very interesting over covid is uh so we and other DPOs were being engaged with by um the cabinet office disability unit and because they they were trying to understand how the pandemic was affecting disabled people they, they weren't doing very well at that and as we now know it was pretty disastrous but they they tried for a while but then they so we started meeting more as a group of dpos around the country and you know that was useful for us as well just in a networking kind of point of view but then the government cancelled a, a series of these meetings in a row at the height of the pandemic they stopped talking to disabled people's organizations which is you know disgraceful and i think one of the reasons why they did so badly in their pandemic response as we know we 60 percent of deaths were disabled people which is absolutely disgraceful um so what came of that is that we all took well if the government has stopped meeting with us though we're still getting value out of us meeting together so let's sort of try and carry that on so we we have and it's it evolved to become called the dpo forum england and at the moment that now is uh, is unfunded. There's also Reclaiming Our Futures Alliance, who are part of DPO Forum England. Um, and so we are, I think, this year looking at how to combine all of these and have it funded, have some kind of an administration or secretariat that could, you know, um, do that job of, you know, that you need to do of keeping that kind of um, the administration of it going, organizing meetings, um, having you know maybe seminars things like that and so that is uh, uh something we need to try and figure out this year I think to have that national voice because when it, it's interesting is when it comes to international um forums at the moment there is not a voice of England's disabled people's organizations that can you, you know if there's a, a United Nations meeting or there's a meeting of the Commonwealth or there's a, meet, a European meeting uh, which we can you know regardless of brexit there is still things we go to in europe um there isn't actually a kind of a representative 
um, body of English DPOs to go to those at, at the moment. And so our job is maybe this year to figure out how to do that and get some funding for it. Although at the moment, obviously, funding is a super diff difficult thing. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's a really long answer to your question. So. No, it's a great answer. Thank you very much. So what we haven't done is talk about Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People and what you do. So what do you what do what do you do as an organization? Well, um like most DPOs, we we don't have um core funding to spend at our discretion. So we work off specific project funding and then put into a common pot to which we can use towards you know our sort of ambitions but um so i my main job at the the coalition is the greater manchester disabled people panel which is something that came of um this deaf and disabled people's organizations in greater manchester um bef when it was announced they were going to have um metro mayors so we uh, consulted with each other and said, all right, so, and we, we developed the Sell People's Manifesto that we put to the candidates and said, would you agree with this manifesto? And we organized the hustings. And Andy Burnham, then the candidate for, for mayor for Labour, um, he did come to the hustings and he said, I've read your manifesto and I agree with it. And if I get elected, I'll work with you, you know, to 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 make... Um, how we how we do policy with disabled people better and um this is always uh kind of you know it's it's become a bit of a cheesy joke now but amazingly he kept his promise a politician that keeps his promise <laughs> and so once he was elected said okay let's let's reconvene this group so we got again all the dpos back together in manchester and said okay how are we going to progress this and so we 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 created this structure of a panel. Um, we got funding for it from from the combined authority. We have a partnership agreement with them, so we are independent, but we are able to talk at a very high level with them. We, I'd say we're sort of positioned like a critical friend, um, and that's been pretty successful so far. And we've talked to other cities and city region places, and they have you know they'd like to put one together or they try to do something like that. There has been, there's a Cheshire to sale people's panel, which is modeled on it. And I think we did help get the, the Bristol disability commission going, although um, I think that's un unfunded at the moment. Um, so that's what I do. And um, that's my main job. So, and my colleague Jane is the strategic lead on that. And so a really simple version of it is, is we basically, um, get all of our member organizations together we discuss issues we have we bring in system leaders and the mayor we talk to them they talk to us and then you know we 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 say well this would be a better policy or that would and we've done two huge surveys um which have created much more work for us and our last one was huge and we're now we got uh, over 50 recommendations from it and so now they're working on a, a task group that is going to try and bring um some of those recommendations into actual real happening policy um we also were instrumental in getting the inequality board set up in greater manchester um so and that, so that's quite a big sort of political rights-based system change project that the coalition does and that's a really have... neat thing that's a really neat thing because it's incredibly proactive of you as an organization because a lot of so I'm involved in this project. I was involved in, in a project called Disabled People's Organization Sharing Experiences During COVID. And I got some funding for that for two years. Mm. And it was part of the lottery funding, uh, part of the Leaders with Lived Experience program. And so there are a lot of different leaders with lived experience from lots of different organizations. So there is lots of organizations from black and minority ethnic groups and LGBTQIA groups, as well as disabled people's organizations and a variety of other lived experience groups. Um, and one of the questions that arose at a meeting was what would help you and your organization to thrive? What would you need in order for your organization to thrive? My response to which is number one is obviously core funding. And you mentioned there you don't have core funding while well, DPOs don't get core funding. We just mm. don't have it. And I said, we need core funding to thrive because back in the early days in the seventies and the eighties, when we were all set up as organizations, um, we had ideas about what we wanted to do. 
And a lot of those ideas have vanished by the wayside and had to disappear because there is no core funding. And the places that we get funding influence the work that we do. And a lot of the work that we do is now kind of local authority work and health work and social care work, which, of course, we want to do. And we would be always have been involved in that. But it's not necessarily where we would have put ourselves. You know, we're not. We're not service provision organisations. We are political rights organisations as well as arts organisations and social organisations and other organisations, you know. Yeah. And so that notion about thriving, I think, is a very proactive idea in my mind rather than a reactive idea. Well, it's funny. We we recently just, um, because of some changes that have happened in Greater Manchester and one, one of our partner organizations lost a big contract so we did actually do a really quick kind of sense check of of organizations what what's your funding situation like what your hope you know what what do you think the future is going to be and um most of them were relatively i would say let's let's say pragmatic but pessimistic and none nobody has core funding and yeah that's absolutely um because that's then at your at the discretion of a rights-based organization we know best what we should be doing and core funding is, and I would say that, yeah. So there's one message that can come from this podcast is core funding. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully there's some eccentric billionaires listening or something. But um, well, uh, dream, let's hope that. Let's hope yeah. that. <laughs> but so the other thing, so, and we have an advocacy project. So um, that uh, is uh, often, you know, because of the how poor the benefit system is, that's often most of that is helping people with their PIP Um forms and assessments and appeals but you know it does wider things sorry Pip uh, we being, have young people's pip being the personal independence personal independence payment yeah that replaced disability living allowance um we have, there's a young young people's project um which involves the young creators as well and they've done amazing things with contact theater manchester um, and in fact at our last um event for international sale people's day we had a string quartet and poetry readings via the young creatives. It was very classy. No. Oh, it was, it, we were, you know, oof, it was great. Yeah. Um, and let me think. So um, projects, uh, young people, advocacy. Uh, we've got um, like regular members meetings and uh, like volunteer and kind of skill, skill growing workshops. That doesn't, you know, kind of, sharing of skills but you know up, up, upskilling people as well um because i think you know one of one of the challenges we, you know you face in this funding environment is there's not there's not kind of a load of people just waiting to advocate for you or to give you legal advice or whatever uh, we have to train ourselves and do it ourselves now it's the only solution so hoping to do that kind of peer advocacy things like that we've we've got some capacity to do some, some more campaigning as well um but uh, I'd, I'd say, by and large, um, uh, the coalition, you know, if, if you're in Greater Manchester, or let's say the North, we're not really super strict about these things. Let's say the Northwest. Um, it's free to join. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, alone, we're just a lone voice. But if you join with another group, you, you join with a bigger group of disabled people, um, we can make more change happen. And that's what we're interested in is... Um, making sure that disabled people can live the best lives and slowly um, removing those disabling barriers from society um, at a regional and a national level where we can. So how um, you mentioned that they've got lots of um, DPOs in Manchester. How many DPOs do you have in Manchester? Um, well, let me So there's 15 on the panel as such. There's probably, um, let me think, let's say may, there might be another five kind of floating about to some level or another. And uh, after that, it kind of, well, it depends what you're defining. Uh, those are sort of more formal organizations. Then you've got kind of that sort of a community group or a community forum. So they won't have like a formal legal structure and they probably don't go for funding that much, but you know, it's a, it's a community group and they're doing good stuff. And if that's one of the things that we talked about last year with um, some of the sort of third sector funders is, actually recognizing that you need to um, have a, a system that supports organizations that don't necessarily have a bank account or a treasurer or a, you know, a constitution, but they're doing good things. They're small, but they need, you know, and if those people aren't able to keep doing that, then 
you know, the knock on effect of um, people then losing that community, losing that activity, um, that probably their, their inclusion will suffer, their health will suffer. Um, so it, it has sort of these peripheral costs that then transfer onto health and social care systems. So it's actually, it makes good sense to be supporting these small groups as well. But those are really hard to sort of um, quantify in Great Manchester. But, I, you know, probably we've got 10, you know, 10 districts, 10 local authorities across Great Manchester. I, there's probably a few hundred scattered around of those very small community groups. But yeah, in, in DPAs, it's 15 to 20, I would say. Great which are very difficult to see and very difficult to count if you're kind of outside of the area because they're very yeah, local yeah. knowledge, isn't it? It's... Yeah, and I, I remember when we were mapping, did a sort of scoping and mapping exercise when we were drawing up the panel. Um, over the course of austerity, um, you know, since since 2008, really, uh, there has been a, a die-off of groups and organisations in the hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's just no way, you know, it absolutely devastated um, that kind of cohort. Yeah, I mean, I knew there was a group down here and they basically went from to people's houses. They didn't have any formal constitution. They weren't a group of people They didn't have any funding, but they basically went from house to, to disabled people's houses with a toolbox and then opened the toolbox. And it's full of art kit and just sat with that person, did art for two or three hours every afternoon or every once a week or whenever it was. And that was a group and they did that. And it was a real kind of social contact, kept all people, you know, engaging with the things and engaging with the world. And like you say, without those kind of really small organisations that nobody would ever know existed, mm -hmm. they would probably not even call themselves an organisation. They're just a group of yeah. people that meet up and do it. Um, without those organisations, then the fallback on statutory services will be much, much greater and much stronger. Yeah, and I, th I think it's 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 actually, it's sort of, I feel like the, those groups get shortchanged because they're, they're doing invaluable things, but they're basically not, you know, they're not being funded either. And they, sh you know, uh, uh, services at a national and a local level know they rely on them, but they also know that they're not giving them any support. So, yeah. you know, how the funding system does that, and, you know, remains to be said, but it does need to think about it and it does need to do it. You know, it's very, whenever you apply for kind of, um a grant to you know something it's it's a tedious bureaucratic process and unless you've got people who are good at that so you need to be at that certain size and people who are good at that kind of thing and these organizations they don't they're not big enough and they don't have that expertise and it's like that is a barrier i would i would call that a disabling barrier in how you know groups are supported yeah and so what's the big deal in manchester right now what's for disabled people what are the big big issues at the moment would you would you see i mean there's lots of big national issues or do you have sort of very local ones that are affecting you in and people in manchester above which wouldn't be affecting somebody in london necessarily or us down here in cornwall um well i should stress it we're, we we think we try and think in terms of greater manchester the whole the whole big lot which is sorry my language yeah i'm sorry yeah um two two point eight million people roughly um so roughly about uh, 600,000 disabled people, or, you know, you want to make it easy to think about half a million, um, you know, but, um, it is the, I, because, um, demographically, uh, the region is a little bit poorer and has slightly poorer health than the national average. So those have, um, amplifying effects on the disabled community, of greater Manchester. Um, so, health social care benefits and housing i think but again that's not unusual anywhere it really isn't um transport what well, is interesting so i i lived on anglesey for 10 years a, a very rural area um and so it is yeah it the the it is different but it's also you also, a lot of similarity in the issues that hit people. It's just maybe the solutions are harder to get going because of the population density is very different. Um, transport is is improving, uh, hopefully, because we we were the first area of the country to get privatised buses, and it's been disastrous for 40 years. And so the combined authority and Andy Burnham have slowly been trying to get the buses back under some kind of organised 
franchise control, which they've now managed, and they're starting to roll that out towards the end of this year. So um, that hopefully will mean a more standardised, more accessible bus services, uh, because we do have the um, Metro Tram, which was designed from the ground up, and that is pretty accessible. Uh, Although we still have that problem of, you know, stations that are rendered accessible by a lift um, are always based on, is the lift working? Yeah. And the the one rule of lifts is they break down. They break down and there's always a queue, so you're never going to catch a train. So so hopefully that transport uh, will come on better. And, yeah, definitely from our our survey, what was interesting is – Poverty has has become like a it's become really ingrained. It's it's not just our uh, people have had a couple of lean years. There are now ten or more solid years of progressively not being able to afford everything you need to live a decent life. So that's had a really damaging impact on people. And then we found it through the survey is that there's a high correlation with poor housing. So we know that there's an undersupply of accessible houses and not enough houses are being built and there's not enough adaptions being made and cooperation to help people get the disability facility grant is very poor in housing associations and councils. So all of that together mean that um, an awful lot of disabled people are not living in a property that's suitable for them. Or if it could be made suitable, they are not being helped to get that support to make it make those adaptions. And once that happens, a lot of the other problems start cropping up as well. Um, so I think there's there's one there's you know there's something to be said uh, that um, accessible housing is should really 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 be something that any new development is embodying in a serious way. So for example, we we want we want Greater Manchester to adopt what uh, London is doing which is that any new builds, 10% of those are wheelchair accessible and they're all built to that slightly higher standard. So if you want to make it accessible, it's easier. And it's not that much additional cost to the builders. It's just, you know, making everyone agree to do that. Yeah, it's not a much greater cost to the builders, but it's a massive cost to the local authority when they have to go in and make yes. inaccessible properties accessible and which they can't afford to do at the moment because they're all having their budgets cut. You know, in Cornwall, if there's not an accessible property nearby, you get moved to the nearest one, and that might be literally 100 miles away. And suddenly you lose all your friends, your family, your contacts, your social support, all of it. Yeah. Well, uh, it's. Um, I mean, what's interesting is they're all setting their budgets at the moment, and while some of them have got cuts, most of them have got cuts lined up again. But they're also, oh, sorry, there's someone at the door. Can we pause? We can pause. I'll pause. Really it. sorry. No, no, don't worry. There we go. So that's been fantastic. A great introduction to Manchester and the work that you're doing up there. You know, it's a massive, it sounds like a massive project that you're involved with um, and an organisation with all your work cut out for you. So, you know, good luck fighting the fight, I guess. Well, thank you. But and I'll say, you know, the the Nothing About Us exhibition at the People's Hist- Nothing About Us Without Us exhibition at the People's History Museum is ongoing for most of this year. So, um, hey, everyone, come and have a look at it. It's totally co-produced with disabled people. First one of its sort in the country. And, uh, you know, if, if you're coming along to Greater Manchester or, you know, you're having like a group trip, you know, get in touch with the coalition. Tell us you're coming. Maybe we could, you know, hang out and stuff. That'd be cool. But, um, which which yeah. museum is it at? Which museum? People's History Museum. In Manchester. Yeah, the Nothing About Us Without Us exhibition. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, so and, and the other th- I think I'd like what I'd like to finish on is if you're in an area and you've not got a disabled people's organization, then why not start one? <laughs> in in the end, it, it started GMCDP started from a few disabled people getting together and going. Yeah, let's uh, let's build something, and th- from that seed, you know. So if you've not got one in your area, um, it's only going to happen if if you um, get together and and start that that little movement, start that you know conspiring together to build something. And I, I can absolutely guarantee that wherever there's a DPO, um, you 
begin to get much better response from like councils and services and businesses because they know that there's a there's an organizer you know there's a collective they they can't really ignore a bunch of people as easily as they can ignore one person the whole system is set up to ignore individuals they they worry when a whole group comes towards them and says make this accessible please or change this there's um there is a bit of work that needs to be done i think to demonstrate the value of disabled people's organizations both in terms of what happens in relation to disabled people locally as well as what the local environment looks like and the scenario looks like in terms of local authorities health authorities local businesses transport all of that what impact mm -hmm. does a dpo have on all of those things i think it would be a great study to do and it would be a very positive study to demonstrate the value of dpos yeah and i i you know i do think that local authorities and third sector they should consider it kind of, you know, a requirement that they fund a DPO, I think, and fund it in that hands-off way. It's core funding. They don't have any influence over you. You know, the the, the disabled people forming that organisation can set their agenda because we know, you know, our lives are the best and we know what needs changing the best. Yeah, I mean, it's how we started here in Cornwall. It's a bunch of people came together and said, hey, hang on a minute, there isn't one, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. I mean, yeah. The only way to go. Hey, listen, Rick, it's been fabulous taking up your time. Thank you very much for your words. And uh, thank let's, you. Let, let's stay in contact. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Theo. This has been really nice. Thanks.